So thanks for coming back after lunch, and hopefully I'll uh, make sure everybody's awake for the next session by, by going through really, really fast. So what I'm going to do today is talk about some of the things we have done at Cray and the experience we have learned in trying to figure out what is it to build HPC systems for AI customers and go the other way, build AI systems for HPC customers. And so what's, what is it that uh, we can learn? And it started off as an experiment in 2012 where we said, if we took HPC technology, if we took the interconnects and said, ran what we run on cloud computing, commodity hardware, from a software stack perspective, on HPC hardware, what does it do and what is the difference? Since then, what we've come up with in terms of lessons is that there's a lot more opportunity in going the other way, taking HPC best practices and putting it into, uh, into, into some of the software stacks that uh, data science folks are using. So what I'm gonna do is walk you through what Cray has been calling the convergence of hardware, software, and systems for performance and productivity through this entire, entire product line, right? So we started off with the hardware first over here with the Eureka GX. The software stack was ported on to make, it sure, make sure it works on a Cray. And now what that has happened is that we've taken that software stack that used to work on this hardware, and now we're able to run it on any supercomputer that, uh, that Cray is building going forward. And so given that, today, the specific focus that I've taken on is, the, is to talk about the experience that's come out of a few customers that you would traditionally think of as commercial customers doing data science world, buying supercomputers, and the traditional supercomputer folks going the other, other side and saying, I want to do some data science work on my supercomputers. I want to walk you through some of these uh, use cases. So every time we worked with one of them, be it Deloitte, be it Stanford, be it Samsung for autonomous cars, or be it one of the top five pharma companies that want to remain anonymous, if you think about all of them, each one of them went through a journey. And, and the journey looks something like this. With every one of them, we had to work with the problem formulation level, and I call this the deep learning maturity chart, where you work with them on trying to define a problem on their particular data set, and what's most important there is trying to find the time to solution and making sure they have an ROI for the problem. Once that happens, the second thing is about trying to productionize the code by selecting the appropriate toolkits, selecting the appropriate interfaces to the data and so forth, and then designing with them what the future looks like in terms of topologies that they need to train on the network and so forth. Once you get to that level of maturity, generalizability becomes a more important metric. So you walk them through this process of saying, here is the first time to solution. Sometimes even 50% accuracy is better than nothing, so that's already accepted there. And once you know how to build a model, you want to take that 50% to 75%. And once you've taken it to 75%, you want to be able to say, I want this model to work every day, so that becomes your generalizability problem. And once you get to this level, where your maturity is to say, I have a model that I can make money off of and it's stable enough, you start thinking about investing in hardware and so forth. Once that happens, you have, a, by that time, a pool of people that are able to run deep learning models in your, in your enterprise, in your organization. You start thinking about how can you reduce the time to accuracy. On a typical problem formulation to, uh, to, to actual training, it's taking about a month or so to just, after the formulation, to train a particular model to the desired level of accuracy. When you're here, you're thinking about how do I reduce it to a few days to a few hours. And once you do that, you're thinking about how do I scale out and build hundreds of models and do it on the same infrastructure. And that typically happens on use cases such as autonomous driving and so forth. And as you keep going along and more mature customers and more mature expectations of the deep learning models come through, you're looking for interpretability and explainability at that level where it's a much higher order scale of a problem to run deep learning workloads. So in the typical enterprise world, so I'm gonna split the two worlds as the enterprise world and the scientific computing world. And in the enterprise world, you have one business problem typically. You have one data source that's in a warehouse and you're basically curating that data back and forth. And you put that through this model training infrastructure, which is basically either extracting features from the data, splitting it into multiple sets, the test sets, the training set, the validation set, and doing this training iteratively with a bunch of data scientists, deep learning scientists, engineers, whatever the names that, uh, that they carry on with them. And then you put them through an inner cycle of model testing before you actually put it on deployment for outward facing, user facing, customer facing uh, deployments. And that actually decides the accuracy of your model. So the entire process is your data keeps accumulating on one side, you keep splitting the data depending on what's more relevant and you keep doing the ETL work on this side. Training happens in parallel, but then after your deployment, that feedback comes back to say, hey, your search worked well yesterday, it's not working today, so go do the same thing over and over again to, to make it better for, for the newest data. So what has happened when you typically work with these enterprise customers is that they, the workloads fall into different kinds of categories. So the first few is the, like the one that I mentioned with continuous workloads where data that you collect tomorrow is going to be different from today's and is different from yesterday's, so you have to build a model every day. And so there are workloads that, that, that come up with those kinds of continuous requirements. 
There are workloads that have to have a cadence associated with it. This is typically data sets you're collecting by doing multiple interventions. And I typically pull uh, Uber Eats example here because you have multiple parties involved, right? So you've got a driver, you've got a restaurant, and then you've got a customer, all three of them trying to match what's going on. And Uber is incentivizing all three to be smart about each other, and you have to wait for a particular time before you actually know something has happened. Some training is just delta. They don't want to retrain existing models. An example is, is with Siri. Common words are well understood. It's the rare words that need more training. So you collect more data about rare words, and then you start training your models over there. There's one time in the HPC workloads where you're trying to create one model and you're done. You never go back to it afterwards. And then you take the same data sets in the throughput workloads, and you pound it out to a number of users to say, my initial problem was to do text-to-speech, but now my problem is a little bit different. I want to be able to detect the speaker as well from the same data. Right, so you get that kind of uh, workload patterns, pattern activities around deep learning with enterprises. With HPC folks, it's slightly different. Right? So we are used to taking codes that have been extremely well optimized. And your code typically looks like this, where you've taken a particular algorithm, you've looked at the parallel, parallelizable I.O. components, parallelizable compute components, and you have a serial dead zone in the middle somewhere. And you've already figured out how to optimize this in one particular architecture. What happens typically there is you take one or more of these apps and you try to embed the AI workflow that I just talked before in the middle of your simulations or in the middle of your workflow that involves multiple simulations to do one of these three. You're either trying to say, I'm going to be running a long experiment. Steer me if I'm not going towards convergence. Or the alternative could be, try to put me through this ensemble analysis because I have data that came from thousands of simulations over tens of years that I've done. Try to help me understand, based on those ensembles I've already collected, how to make better decisions, how to run better simulations, make my flops smarter. The third part is the proxy to inverse problems. So there's several dimensions of the same problem, and you can model every problem into one big, huge model. So you're saying, I want several small problems to be represented using AI, and they can be represented at different levels of uncertainty, and going forward, try to integrate that into, into my workflows. So for those kinds of uh, HPC workflows that require AI, we are seeing that it's very, very creative. The space is not one workflow like I mentioned before. It's quite different. So you have to start thinking about making sure your AI workload works across processors. Your AI workload is able to seamlessly work between the source of the data, the processors, and the actions you're going to take. And there's different ways in which all these interact, and the expectations that you will be able to interact with these is a lot different than what you would expect with, uh, with enterprise workloads, where it's a, it's a linear one-to-end -one process. And so in terms of differences, I talked about architecture, and I, I, I won't go through the details of uh, this slide, but the, the, the summary here is that there is distinct differences between the way we write parallel code and the way we write distributed code. And, and by the construct of the problem itself, the nature of AI problems being data parallel versus the, the scientific computing problems being separable and, partial, and predictable in terms of splitting the workload and partitioning the workload and so forth, it's, it's very, very unique and different. And so, so the, the, the next slide I'm going to talk about is trying to see when you translate those differences that you saw between scientific computing and enterprise computing, and translated it to just the complexities that it comes with when you're a scientific user versus an enterprise user, it, it comes down into various factors, right? So just the thought of data alone, from being a vector matrix tensor to table key values objects. This is where most of the AI enterprise world is, right? You have data that's images, data that's speech signals, data that is uh, video, data that's, that's text, and so forth. Versus here, you're dealing with scientific structures, you're dealing with tensors, you're dealing with 3D point clouds, and so forth. And in terms of workload from a HPC user, before he or she is able to publish a paper, he, she, she or she has to go through this process of creating these ROC curves, which is an order n squared model training problem by definition, right? Versus I showed you in the, in the pipeline graph where a subject matter expert does A-B testing. Two models are shown to two different populations, and whichever performs better wins, right? So that's more of a manageable project than, than running an ROC curve for hundreds of models. And then the search itself, is defined mathematically in our HPC space, which means you're looking for properties like periodicity, which has a mathematical function, which is quite different from self-similarity, which is quite different from an anomaly and so forth. And so using some of these techniques and implementing them is domain-specific and heuristic. Specific to deep learning alone, if you think about the differences in, in the types of uh, workloads, you're thinking through the model definition itself is very domain specific. What works in physics doesn't work for chemistry, doesn't work for, uh, work for you know, seismic uh, processes and so forth. And the baseline, and if you look at most of the competitions that have been going on, the AI folks that, that, that show off benchmarks and, and, and beat humans, 
the benchmark is humans. If you can do better than a human, and you can do it faster than the human, you're done. Be it ImageNet, be it uh, Deep Speech, be it Go, be it playing chess, whatever it is. But with the science folks, you literally have to beat 40 plus years of theoretic research, right? And, and, and maybe even 400 years of research sometimes. And so what, what we also observe is that the kind of parallelism that they're used to is, is the model parallelism and the ensemble parallelism with the scientific community world, but it's typically small data sets that, that are in the enterprise world. And so the source file systems are different. And so if you typically talk to a HPC person and tell them, hey, do you have an IO issue? The answer would probably be no, Luster is taking care of it. If you talk to the same person that's running the same kind of data sets on a HDFS file system, you hear IO sucks, right? So it's the same problem, same data, different people with different uh, backgrounds that are running the same data sets. And in terms of figure of merit, what's most important for science is interpretability and just doing it one time to show that it works. Versus here, it's the ability to repeat the time to accuracy and bring down the model size sometimes because where you're going to deploy is on a mobile phone, right? So those are things that are happening. And so the key aspect that I also emphasize here is that the difference in types of data, the number of labeled examples that are automatically generated in the enterprise world doesn't compare with what we do in the sciences. In the sciences, your genome is probably 600 gigabytes per file, you know, per person. You have thousands of those samples and tens of categories that you can put, put, on, uh, put as labels on those data sets, which means your GPU now has to be able to take a 65, 650 gigabyte file to read even one genome sequence. Versus here, the traditional world, you're used to taking kilobytes of small data, millions of those kilobytes of small data, and then being able to classify them into 10,000 categories. Right, so these are all some key differences that, uh, that we have seen so far in terms of uh, deploying AI between the, the scientific field and the enterprise field. And so what are the things that we are seeing today that, that need some attention? So the first thing that I'm going to bring up is the potential of uh, off-node I.O. requirements. This is the typical structure of any node that you can buy off the shelf. This is not just Cray, this is NVIDIA, this is whoever you want to think about it. You have GPUs, you have CPUs, you have local SSDs, and then you have a file system that tries to feed this, uh, this particular node. And so what's happening is you're making three copies every time. So you're copying one from the file to the local, and then file to the SSDs, and then across GPUs, when you're trying to do some workload that's multi-node, you're trying to swap data across GPUs and across GPUs and multiple nodes as well. So there's three literal copies that, uh, that are happening, right? And so, what does it mean in terms of limitations from taking the I.O. problem into, into something that's much more tangible? So here is two completely different set of papers published. The top one is from NVIDIA that talks about what the I.O. challenge is. Right? So if you're trying to feed different networks, different models, VGGs and ResNet 101s and 150s and so forth, at two different I.O. rates, one at 4,800 images, images per second, another closer to 10,000 images per second. The reason why everybody publishes ResNet 50 today is because that's when you can keep the I.O. beast feeding the compute that you already have available and you've paid for. So that's this particular spot over here where your ResNet 50 model is able to handle I.O. robustly and you've made the maximum use of your GPUs. But what we keep forgetting, and this is critical to both the AIF HPC community and the other one, is that there is a limit. You just can't add, keep adding more data and expect to get better results with deep learning and AI. And that is the region where you're gonna hit a point where you don't need any more new scale out and scale up. And so if you looked at some of the results here, the key point that I'm trying to make here is that if you looked at people that, that, that have done software changes, algorithmic changes, to, to going from small mini-batches to large mini-batches by doing a, doing a, a quick uh, algorithmic stochastic gradient assumption, they've gone from problems that take two days to an hour versus purely hardware. We didn't even use some of the hardware solutions. The same problem could have been solved in 14 minutes on 1,000 GPU systems. So it's about what can you trade. If you had a supercomputer today already, you can do problems of this size and at this scale, right? And so just one last slide looking ahead, what, what we could do going forward is that this is coming. This is coming at us, right? So we've got the network depth going from 20x to 16x between 2012 and 2015, but that translated to 13% increase in accuracy. And this goes back to the limits I was talking about. And then the data size is doubling. When you double the data for the same model, your compute requirement went five times over, but you only got a 3% change. So if all this is happening, and your number of models is going to increase in, in, in the enterprise, we have a lot, of, lot more challenges to solve. And hopefully, that's my last slide there, there we go. And the future is going to look something like this. It's going to have general purpose flexibility, where commodity configurations fit into different parts of your supercomputer. It's going to be seamless heterogeneity, where you don't understand the differences across processors. It's going to be high performance interconnects that looks like interconnects that are there in the data centers today, with both MPI and TCP compatibility. And you're going to start looking at a unified software stack that does AI, analytics, and HPC together. 
So with that, I'll stop and uh, I think I ran out of time, so thank you. <laughs>